my name is Tony Lynch, and I work at the ELTC at the University of Edinburgh. I've been asked to talk about second language listening and the issues and challenges for teachers interested in developing their students' ability to deal with spoken language. Part of my work at ELTC involves running courses and designing materials to help international students cope with the demands of listening to their courses in English. I also work with University of Edinburgh academics to help them to make their lectures more understandable and more accessible to international students. But in this talk today, I'm going to look more generally at the teaching of listening skills, not academic listening in particular. And so I hope you'll find it relevant to whatever context you teach in. The talk will be in three parts, which I'm calling input, interaction, and output. And I'm using those terms for two reasons. Firstly, they offer a framework for looking at different aspects of listening beyond the simple picture of listening as a one-way process. And secondly, they are a reminder that listening is involved in all three parts of the process of using and learning the language. So the first section is input. Now it's not so very long ago that most language learners had only one source of spoken input in the language that they were studying, and that was the voice of the teacher in their classroom. Only a minority of learners were able to listen to recordings of native speakers. Uh, I can remember that about a year after I started learning French at secondary school in the early 1960s, our teacher brought in a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, which most of us had never seen before. And that allowed us to listen to a sort of French which seemed to be quite different to the sounds that came out of the French teacher's mouth, but that's another story. Now in the past 30 years or so, we've seen a rapid development in various electronic media, and one of the consequences is that many more learners, perhaps now most learners, now have access to a wider range of voices in the language that they're studying. And what is more, learners who have their own computer or smartphone can take advantage of that access at any time and anywhere, so that the classroom, the language classroom, is no longer the only site where they can hear the target language. So potentially, the availability of a wide range of inputs offers learners the opportunity for practice in listening to a second language. Some strong claims have been made, as they always are, for the benefits of electronic media. Each new generation of technology excites predictions that this is the one that's going to bring really, really radical changes to the way that languages are taught. The problem is that developments in hardware tend to run ahead of the pedagogic purposes for which teachers might want to use it. And so one challenge for language teachers is to find ways of doing what Stephen Ryan has called, I'm quoting now, empowering foreign language students to make effective use of the potential language learning materials that exist around them. Now, Stephen Ryan was writing in the context of teaching English as a foreign language in Japan. But I think it's worth pointing out that the spread of digital technology 
is beginning to break down the conventional distinction between foreign language and second language settings. To quote uh, John Field, the world has changed considerably in the past 25 years, one of the consequences being a vast proliferation of visible and audible samples of English, even in remote areas. So far then, all this is positive. Thanks to the new digital media, most language learners and teachers have easier access to a wider range of natural spoken input than ever before. The downside is that it is also easy to get carried away with what is technically possible and to let that cloud our vision of what is pedagogically useful. Ebards and Webb, for example, have written of the need for a technology-driven pedagogy technology-driven pedagogy, which worries me a bit. I think the direction should really be the other way, using proven teaching practice to determine how best to use technology. Now I'd like to give you an example of what I might call a technological approach. It arose in a program for learners of Japanese studying at the International Student Center at Tokushima University in Japan. The aim of the project should be clear from its name, which was LOCH, L-O-C-H, Language Learning Outside the Classroom with Handhelds. And LOCH was the result of collaboration between researchers in informatics and teachers of Japanese. Now in Loch, the teachers gave the, series, uh, gave the students a series of listening and speaking tasks which they had to carry out in the local area, so not in the school itself. And each learner was given a PDA, Personal Digital Assistant, with GPS and PHS. PHS is Personal Handy System. And that combination of devices allowed them to access their own language learning data and video and audio files. And they could also access the net. And they could record their interactions with native speakers. And using the PHS, they could also call each other and the teacher as they moved around the city. The teacher stayed back at the center and was able to track each learner's position using the GPS. Here's an example of the sort of task that Loch learners carried out. So these are the instructions. Go to the tourist information stand at Tokushima railway station and inquire about the places you can visit in one day and the price. Record the answer of the stand attendant and send it back. Now the journal article that the research team wrote about the Loch project is extremely upbeat. I'm quoting here, wireless mobile learning devices offer stunning technical capabilities for the development of new systems because of their portability and low cost. Now for me, Loch is a very clear example of what can go wrong on different levels when what is technically feasible is assumed to be pedagogically appropriate. The researchers feel they can make strong claims for the success of the project. From their conclusion, I'm quoting, the teachers were more reachable and the knowledge became more available due to the IP phone. The students could easily reach the teacher when having troubles, and the teachers could immediately redirect them when they were not achieving the expected results. Now, it's really that last expression, the expected results, that I'm concerned about. 
what the Loch Dirt learners do, it seems to me, is complete a closely specified series of tasks set by a teacher who is able literally to monitor their progress through the tasks using GPS. The learners video record and audio record the answers they get from the people they speak to and they send those answers back to the teacher. Now potentially they could make effective use of the data they gather for further classroom work such as analyzing naturally spoken Japanese but no such activities are described in the paper. One of the great advantages of mobile technology is its potential for giving learners greater control over access to listening sources. But in the LOCK project, control is exerted by the teacher or task designer over the actions of the learners. So I think the challenge for language teachers is to find ways of harnessing digital listening sources in ways that will provide interesting uh, learning, listening and learning activities. And for insights into that sort of activity, inside and beyond the classroom, I recommend that you read the online journal called Language, Learning and Technology. So the second section of the talk I'm calling Interaction. Interaction can be used in two senses about listening. One, the first one is in terms of the internal interaction inside our heads. And behind me here you see I've drawn a little diagram showing the sources of information that we use when we're listening. So at the top we have the schemata, the background knowledge, the socio-cultural knowledge, the knowledge of the world. In the middle we have context, and at the bottom, in this diagram, we have language. So we use our knowledge of language within a context. We combine it with the background knowledge, the schematic knowledge that we have, and we make sense. So this interaction, in this sense, interaction is going on inside our heads. So for example, um, I'm going to give you two lines from a conversation. In fact, it was all the conversation between a friend of mine and somebody else. And I'd like you to try and think about how, what sense you make of it and how you make sense. So the first person, the A and B. The first person said to B, A said to B, can you tell me where the gravy is? Can you tell me where the gravy is? And B replied, I'm sorry, I'm a cyclist. I'm sorry, I'm a cyclist. So the entire conversation was, can you tell me where the gravy is? I'm sorry, I'm a cyclist. Okay, I'll come back to what that meant later. Interaction in the second sense is social interaction. And I'd like to get away from the idea that listening is what most teachers and most students think of it as, which is a one-way process. Somebody speaks, they listen. In fact, it's the interaction, it's, it's listening used in conversation, which is perhaps more important for teachers to practice than one-way listening. Arguably, technology, the net, provides plenty of one-way listening and we need to focus as well in the classroom on conversation. And there's a long tradition of regarding uh, conversation as the potential site for learning. So writers about second language acquisition like Evelyn Hatch were saying in the 1970s that it's in conversation that we should, it's to conversation that we should look to find um, good practice. And it's linked, of course, with the more general ideas of um, Vygotsky, that learning takes place through dialogue. So, 
conversation provides us with opportunities for the negotiation of meaning, for getting clarification when we don't understand. And in that sense, I'd like to think of other people as being an important listening resource. So, so far, in the input section, I talked about the prospects for one-way listening input based on the digital media. But I would want to encourage teachers and learners not to ignore the potential learning opportunities of two-way listening with our fellow human beings. That interaction can be face-to-face, -face, which is how I have learned my languages, or at a distance using interactive forms of electronic technology such as webcams and web call software like Skype. Now there is evidence that interacting with real people is not only more stimulating but also appears to bring more tangible benefits for the improvement of listening skills. Um, I carried out a survey here in Edinburgh among students at the University of Edinburgh and I asked them to estimate how much of their time they spent each day on different sorts of listening. One-way listening to TV and radio and so on and two-way listening in conversation. And I also, asked, I also asked them to quantify how much they felt their listening had improved and they expressed that as either less or more than they expected before they arrived in Scotland or as much as they expected. What I found was that the amount of progress they reported in understanding spoken English during their first six months in Britain correlated positively with the number of minutes they estimated they spent each week in conversation, that is listening and speaking, with other users of English, not necessarily native speakers, but it did not correlate with the time they spent on one-way listening. So the challenge for teachers is to develop interesting interactive activities that require learners to listen to each other, to make sense of what they're hearing, and to use it to develop the conversation that they're having. And I find that many classroom tasks in English textbooks don't really provide a need for learners to engage in listening to what their peers are saying. It's possible to complete a task without really listening to what's being said. One way I've developed of uh, designing a, an activity that will require uh, detailed, intensive listening to other students uh, is something I call free talk. And it's designed to capture the individual interests of the learners by giving them uh, the choice of topic. So the starting point for free talk is my assumption that every student coming to a conversation class is interested in something. And it's the teacher's job to give them a chance to talk about whatever that something is. So I leave the choice of topics entirely to the students and I don't prepare any materials for the lesson in advance. At the beginning of the lesson, stage one, I ask them to write down on a sheet of paper a question that they want an answer to or a problem that they want a solution to. There's no restriction on the sort of question that they can ask. It can vary from a purely linguistic question, such as what's the difference between make and do, to the larger questions like the meaning of life. The only criterion is that each person's topic must be something that they're genuinely interest in, interested in hearing an answer or a solution to. So, stage one, they write down their questions. Stage two, I get them to form groups of three or four students and they talk in parallel, these groups, for about 45 minutes, discussing the questions that have been raised by the other students in the group. As they talk, I move from group to group. 
I monitor what they say, and I make a note of anything that I think is worth commenting on. I'm interested in particular in points in the conversations where I notice there was a breakdown in communication, where the students had to negotiate uh, meaning, had to get the conversation repaired, so to speak. And the final part of the lesson, stage three, is for comments on their discussion. So first I ask the learners themselves to report on points that they remember having difficulty with, either in listening or in speaking, and we try to analyse what the cause of the problem was. Sometimes it's an internal cause, they couldn't find the right expression, they couldn't recall it. Sometimes it's an external cause, they had a problem understanding a word that another student used. And after we've discussed their perceptions of the process, I then comment on some of the interaction breakdowns that I've noted. Now, the advantage of free talk is that it encourages participation because each student has a topic that they want dealt with and it generates real communication. So the learners listen intently to each other and they negotiate meaning when they haven't grasped what the other student is saying. Because it's important to them. It's an answer or a solution to their question. And from a discourse analysis point of view, the striking thing is that the interactions that these groups co-construct show many of the features of spontaneous conversation. As it were, they forget that they're in the classroom. Going back to my example, the uh, internal interaction between different sources of uh, information. Remember the conversation went on these lines. Can you tell me where the gravy is? I'm sorry, I'm a cyclist. Now, I don't know what sense you've managed to make of it. What you need to know is the context was a supermarket. So both A and B were customers in the supermarket. A clearly wanted to know where the gravy was. B was a cyclist because she was she is a cyclist. She was wearing an orange uh, high visibility jacket, which A customer A had assumed indicated that she worked in the supermarket. She was apologising. B was apologising for the fact that she couldn't tell A where the gravy was. The reason being that she was only a cyclist. Now I think this is quite typical of the way in which when we're trying to make sense we shuffle backwards and forwards between the possible sources of information that will help. So linguistically it's very simple. Can you tell me where the gravy is? I'm sorry I'm a cyclist. There's nothing problematic there. What you need to know in this case is all to do with the context. Where they were and in this case what clothes one of them was wearing. So that's interaction. The third part of the talk, output. And what I mean by output is the response that a listener produces as they understand or don't understand what they hear. And I want to distinguish outputs in real life listening from those typical in classroom listening. In real life, the listener's response may be minimal. It could be a frown, a frown if they haven't understood. It could be uh-huh to indicate that they have. And the response may even be totally invisible, such as a decision to act later on the information we've just heard. So that would not be visible to the observer, but it would be a response to what we'd heard. And conversely, it's also possible for a listener to produce a visible response that implies that they have understood when in fact they haven't. I think this is quite common in second language listening. Certainly in my conversations with my Spanish neighbours, I know that I can get by, so to speak, when I'm listening by raising an eyebrow and nodding at what the speaker has said and then waiting for my wife, who's more confident and more fluent 
in Spanish than I am to take up the point that's just been made. Now in the classroom, listener output has conventionally focused on the comprehension question, which in fact tests the learner's understanding of the information content of what's been said. But in real life, we listen for a range of purposes, and we produce a range of responses. It's not always a question of neutrally understanding facts. So the challenge that I see for teachers when it comes to listening output is to expand the range of response that we encourage to give the learners a broader experience of reacting to different elements of second language messages. So with that in mind, I make use of the six question types that Christine Nuttall set out in her book on teaching foreign language reading skills. She categorized questions into six categories. The first one, literal comprehension. That's where the answer is stated explicitly in the input. Reorganization question. That's where the answer can be assembled from information in different parts of the input. Inference questions is the third category. Inference is where the answer is implied but not stated in the text, in the input. Fourthly, evaluation. Evaluation questions, that's where the listener is asked to assess whether the speaker's communicative aim was achieved. So that's looking at how effective the, the speaker was in putting their point across. Response. A response question, that's the fifth category. That's where the listener is asked to give a personal reaction to what was said. That may be one of the commonest in real life, commonest in uh, conversation. And the last one, the sixth category, metalinguistic. So metalinguistic questions are intended to raise the learner's awareness of language forms used by the speaker. <coughs> now, I combine those six types of question from Nuttall with ideas from uh, Sidney Whitaker. Some 30 years ago, Sidney Whitaker made a very radical proposal that it should be the learners and not the teachers that ask the questions. Now, he was writing about reading lessons, but the point is the same for listening. So Whitaker based his argument on the observation that human beings are naturally inquisitive, that we look for clues in sensory input, whether it's through the eye or through the ear or both, clues that will assist and confirm our understanding of the unfamiliar. And we come up with a variety of possible responses or answers. Now, by contrast, he argued, language teachers are trained to be tuned in to a single correct answer, so that we tend to close our minds to what are, in fact, perfectly reasonable alternatives. It's possible, for example, that you may have found a perfectly reasonable alternative interpretation of the conversation between the two customers in the supermarket, the one wanting the gravy and the cyclist. Whitaker, Sidney Whitaker argued that it makes better sense to get the learners to ask their own questions about a text than to rely on those of the textbook writer or teacher because the learners' questions reflect their developing interpretation and their level of proficiency in the language. So, what I do is to explain to my students the differences between Nuttall's six question types, to broaden their view of what listeners can be asked to do beyond the conventional literal comprehension question. Um, I then ask them to listen to a text and to come up with their own questions of three or four 
of the six types to get them thinking about different ways of interpreting what they've heard. I also stress, and I think this is important, I also stress that they are free to ask questions to which they don't have the answer, which may of course be the most natural and interesting ones for them to ask. So in this way, each learner takes ownership of the questions that they've written and of the answers that they're prepared to accept. And of course, when there are disputes over an answer, it forces the learners to go back to the input, the text, the spoken word, for confirmation that their answer is either correct or acceptable, or to accept that different outputs, different responses, are possible. So, to conclude, those are my thoughts on the three aspects of teaching listening. Listening input, listening in interaction, and listening output. And I've sketched some of the ways in which teachers could be looking to develop our teaching of second language listening skills. Firstly, finding ways to encourage the learners to exploit the greater accessibility of online listening inputs. Secondly, devising classroom activities that create a genuine need for learners to listen to each other and to negotiate meaning when necessary. And thirdly, extending our repertoire of listening question types to give our students a broader experience of the range of inputs, sorry, the range of outputs that listening can provoke. Thank you for listening.